Well, excited you're here today. If you're our guest today, my name is Ryan. I'm the lead pastor at Curtis Lake, and I uh, get the distinct privilege of working with the hundreds of volunteers and all of our staff here uh, to just bring the hope that's found in Jesus Christ into our community and into our world. And so uh, I'm just thrilled to death that you're here, and we're in our series, Change for Determined Dummies. How many of you, uh, just be honest, and if you're not going to be honest, go ahead and lie. Uh, how many of you have been thinking about an area that you want to change, and you've kind of been trying? in at some levels to think through some of the stuff we've been talking about. So it hasn't been a complete waste of my time every week. Okay, good. Well, there's, there's some of us. That's excellent. So we're in this series, Change for Determined Dummies, and it's really the anchor verse. If you're new to Curtis, like every series that we do has a verse that kind of drives it. And uh, Paul said in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, that I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. And so that's what we're talking about. We're talking about living in all kinds of circumstances, changing patterns and habits in our lives, things that we know God wants us to change, things that we know will be better for us and for the people around us. And so uh, that's what we're talking about, how we can do everything, and really Christ is the foundation for it. And so we've been looking at some principles, and we've been examining Scripture and applying that truth to our lives. And I think this is a great opportunity to get connected with faith, maybe to renew a connection with faith if you're new to church, because you're going to see how practical the Bible really is and how now, when we really dig in and understand, we see God really does have a lot to say about our lives and our future and that they really are filled with hope. How many of you keep a calendar of some sort? Keep a calendar, maybe a home calendar, a calendar at work. How many of you are like me and your calendar is kind of like you love your calendar? It's like Linus's blanket. You know, it provides you comfort. It tells you where you need to go, what you need to be doing. You know, for me, that's what it is. And let me ask you this question. If you keep a calendar or if you just exist within time, all right, which that's all of us, okay? I don't want anybody confused. Most of us exist within time. What is the most productive day for you? Is it uh, Tuesday? Is it Monday? Is it Friday? Because you know the weekend is coming and you just got to get everything done. Is it uh, Thursday, Wednesday, Saturday? What is it in your world, in your life? What is the day that presents to you like the most energy, the most joy? You just feel the most productive and the most successful. What is that day? I think for most of us, the most productive day in our calendars, the best day in our calendars, the day that we love is someday. <laughs> someday. I think someday is probably the best day for all of us. I have a, a, a list that I keep that says someday slash maybe, and it just keeps all of my brilliant ideas, you know. I can't get to it right now, but someday I'm going to do this. And I think in all of our lives, someday is a great day, right? Somebody just post that on Facebook right now. Just put, my favorite day is someday, all right? Just stick that on Facebook. I know half of you are already there checking out what's going on, okay? So post it, all right? At least interact with it a little. So someday is now, because someday is this day where we say what? Someday I'll quit smoking. Someday I'll start exercising. Someday I'll spend more time with my family. Someday I'll go back to school. Someday I'll read the Bible all the way through. Someday, 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 right? And, and it's this day that is wonderful, but it's so surprising that someday never shows up. Some, I mean, Monday happens every seven days. Tuesday happens every seven days. Even Saturday happens every seven days. Someday, however, never seems to find its way to our lives. Well, why is that? Because all those things that happen on someday are things that require us to do what we hate. If you think about the stuff that we would love the idea of, and we love the idea, and we want this to happen someday, and we know that someday it'll be wonderful, and when we do that, it's going to be great, but all the things that are required to make that happen, we don't like to do. We don't like to because it's boring, right? It's just kind of boring. We say, you know what? I, I want to read my Bible all the way through. But the truth is that requires some boring things. That requires reading Leviticus, okay? And, and I get it. You know, I know it's really probably sacrilegious for me to say that there are parts of the Bible that are boring, but there are parts of the Bible that are just boring, Right? If you're not familiar with any of the historical context, if you're not familiar with what's going on, some of the parts of the Bible can be boring. Now, it's still inspired and it's still useful, but man, it can be boring. And so it just takes that, oh, I got to do that. You know, and there are things that we want to do that we just don't do because it's boring, it's not exciting. And then there are things that, that we have to do that oftentimes are just uncomfortable. 
right? I mean, it's just, it, it produces this feeling of uncomfortableness. Like if I want to change my relationship with my children, if I want to change my relationship with my spouse, whatever that might be, we're finding that, you know what, sometimes it's just uncomfortable to have that conversation. It's an uncomfortable conversation, sometimes with myself, where I have to sit and evaluate the things that I'm not doing that I should be doing. And so we, we push back and we don't change things because it's uncomfortable for us. Sometimes the things that we need to do to make someday today, they're just painful. They're just flat out painful. And so we avoid it like the dentist, right? Now, if you're a dentist in here, I'm certainly not down on you. I feel your pain because going to the dentist is a lot like going to the pastor. Nobody really wants to do it. Most of the time people show up to talk to me, it's because there's some pain in their life. Just like when people show up at the dentist, there's a pain, you know, you got to dig in there and deal with it. But it's just true. We avoid stuff like that. Most of us don't need to be motivated to eat chocolate. Right? How many of us have to put it on our calendar on Thursday, I'm going to go get chocolate ice cream, and then we have to go to a support group on Monday to push us through. We got to read some books about ice cream to tell us why we should be doing this anyway. And then when we go do it, we post it everywhere. I actually did it. I met my goal. I had chocolate ice cream today. We don't have to do that because we love it. There's no tension in doing that. We don't love the effects of eating chocolate ice cream all the time, but we love it. And it, that's the truth in our lives. We are wired in such a way to do the things that we love and to avoid the things that we hate. And the problem is, it's easier to do what we love, isn't it? It's easier to do what we love than it is to do what we hate, right? We love, you know, going out and, and spending all kinds of money on great fun stuff, but we hate saving. We love the idea of saving, but we hate what it takes to save. So in our actual choices that we live out every day, we live this principle out. And the problem with change, the problem with bringing change into our lives is that if we live our whole lives constantly just trying to do what we don't like to do, we're going to fail. And so the trick is we have to learn to change our motivations. We have to learn to love what we hate in a sense. We have to learn to love to exercise. How many of you hate exercising, just random exercise? Some of you do. You're not wired correctly. You love exercise. I know that. There's a problem, right? We can counsel that out of you. But for most normal people, we just don't like the idea of, I don't like exercising. I love the effects of exercise. I love how I feel after I exercise, but I just don't like doing it. But if I'm going to get healthy, if I'm going to get in shape, if I'm going to lose the pounds I need to lose from Christmas and Thanksgiving, that means I have to somehow Learn to love what I hate, and that is I need to learn to love to exercise, because if I try to just fight my motivations and fight my urges, I'm constantly going to fail. Because the things that you love to do, you do with ease. And so one of the key ways that we can change is to learn how to love these things that we don't like, and then that will cause us to, to in some ways, have an easier time with change. Now, the, what's fascinating is the Bible actually gives us a hint at how we can do this, how we can begin to work our motivations so that we can change. Because that's really one of the key areas is our personal motivations. We talked about that's how sin works in our lives. Sin wants to keep us in the moment. Sin wants to keep us motivated to do what harms us. Because that's what sin is. It's kind of immediate gratification and long-term pain. And so if we can just focus on what we like to do and not focus on what we like to do where it leads us, then sin is having its victory in our lives. And so one of the ways that we have to do is we have to work on our personal motivations. And scripture gives us a really interesting clue when we look at some very, very successful people, how they did it. And they did it through this thing called faith. Now, when I say the word faith, some of you might immediately think about, oh, well, that's just believing in Jesus. But I want to talk about faith from a broader concept. And really, the writer of the book of Hebrews talks about faith and its importance. Hebrews is an interesting book of the Bible. Hebrews, uh, we're not sure who actually wrote the book of Hebrews. For a while, it was attributed to Paul, and some people think it was Paul, but most people think it wasn't. And, and, the, writer, and the book of Hebrews is a very interesting book, talks a lot about the theology and a lot about God and God's will and God's plan. But there's this wonderful chapter in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, that's called like the Hall of Fame of Faith. And it talks about these different people in the Bible who really did amazing things that people look to to be encouraged with. And so in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, we begin to see one of the really powerful ways that we can change our lives by changing our motivation. And this is what it says. It says, faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. And it goes on to say, through their faith, the people in days of old earned a good reputation. 
Okay, so the Bible's talking here and it's saying, okay, here's the, here's the deal. Faith is this ability to see and believe and feel the future. Faith is the ability to confidently look into the future and see it happening and have the hope that it's going to happen. It's not just this idea that might happen, but faith, as the writer of Hebrews is starting to describe it, is this ability to have this confident hope that what we think is going to happen is going to happen. Now, I want to broaden this out to help us understand something. We need to, if we're going to change our motivations, develop our faith in what can happen on the positive side, but also we need to develop our faith in what will happen on the negative side. Like we need to truly begin to see the future and have faith that it will happen unless we change. So there's the positive and there's the negative side of faith. Faith says I have a confident hope in what will be. So I have a confident hope that if I don't change my exercise habits, if I don't change my eating patterns, I have a confident hope that I'm going to have no energy and I'm not going to be able to do anything productive with my grandchildren. I'm probably not going to be able to do anything productive with my children because I'm going to be out of shape. I'm not going to have the, the energy level that's required to do those things. See, that's a, a level of faith, believe it or not, that says I can see the future. And what the writer of Hebrews says is this was very, very powerful. Because what he said was these people who could see the future and have a hope that it would happen, they gained a good reputation. Now think about in your life, who has a good reputation? Are they productive people or unproductive people? Productive, not a trick question. When I do this, you're supposed to answer, okay? <laughs> are they healthy people, fit people, or are they unhealthy people, unfit people? Healthy people, right? Are they people who get things done or people who talk about getting things done? Right? So a good reputation, according to Bible, comes from this ability to see the future as it can be or as it will be and to leverage that knowledge to make the tough choices. And then what happens in the, in the book of Hebrews, it just gives all these people that made really tough choices. They made all these decisions that might not have made sense in the future, that might seemingly have been doing things that they hated, but they did it because they could see the future. They saw the preferred future and they saw the fearful future the possible pain. And one of those people was Moses, right? And so in, in verse 24, the writer of Hebrews starts talking about Moses, and this is what he says. It was by faith. Now remember, get, think of faith as the ability to see the future, not like, you know, the future, <laughs> right? But the ability to see where this is going to lead, where my choices are going to take me, where the new choices are going to take me, and believing that they really will, will happen, right? Oftentimes, we just don't believe it really is going to happen. So here's the deal. It says, it was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So when Moses grows up, he makes this incredible change in his life. And he says, I am not going to be Pharaoh's, the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Instead, he chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. Now think about that. So Moses, at some point in his life, he grows up and he makes a conscious decision, the writer of Hebrews says, to leave the comfort of Pharaoh's house. How many of you know living for the most powerful, living in the home of the most powerful man in the known world has its benefits? Right? I mean, he, this was not like Joe Schmo. I mean, this was the Pharaoh. This was, the Pharaoh was his grandfather. He had everything he could ever want, everything he could ever need, going to the best schools, all the food, anything he wanted was his. And the Bible says that he chose to leave all that. And he chose to share in the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. Now, what is so powerful about this verse is that Moses understood, and this verse understands, that there is a pleasure in sin. Sin is fun. And anybody who tells you sin is not fun, they have not done the right ones, okay? <laughs> they just haven't. Come talk to me. I've got a list that are very enjoyable. Now, the problem with that fun is it ends, right? The problem with that fun is it ends. That night of fun, drinking too much, it ends. Am I right? Say amen if you've ever had the unfortunate experience of understanding alcohol poisoning. <laughs> See, just own it. Come on, people. We're real here, okay? <laughs> amen. Thank you. Get some realness, all right? See, sin is fun, but it flees. There's a pleasure that's found in these short-term choices, in our bad habits, in the areas that we want to change. And what Moses was able to do, he was able to see his future pain that was found in his present comfort. 
he was able to look into the future and say, if I stay right where I am in Pharaoh's house, if I continue down this path, here's where this will lead me. The sin that I'm surrounding myself with, the choices that I'm compromising, my dishonoring of God, this is the pain that I'm going to find. And he was able to see that and make incredible choices. I am pretty confident that Moses hated the idea of living in the desert. I'm pretty sure that Moses hated the idea of having a limited menu versus the menu that would be before him in Pharaoh's house at dinner time. I'm pretty confident that he hated the idea of not having authority and power and people looking at him with deference when he would walk by. Yet he was able to do what he hated, leave all that behind, because he understood the future pain that would happen. He had faith to see not just the bad, but the good. Or not just the good, but the bad. But then we also find in verse 26, he could do the opposite. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt. Why? For he was looking ahead to his great reward. So not only could Moses see the problem of his sin, the fleeting pleasure, as the writer of Hebrews says, but he could also look ahead and see the great things that would happen from his choosing to suffer, his choosing to do those things that he didn't want to do, that he didn't like to do. He could see the great reward, and that became an intense motivation for him. See, his future reward and his ability to see his future reward, despite his present discomfort, and that motivated him to do stuff that he didn't like. And he became one who loved to do those things. Moses didn't like to lead. We know that from his life. He didn't want to talk. He didn't want to do those things. Those were things that he hated. But he was able to see the possibility of the future. He had faith to believe that the promised land would come, that God's blessing would be in his people. And so he did what he hated, and it changed him. And it changed where he lived. And he became this incredible leader. Not, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't the grandson of Pharaoh. He was the leader of Israel. And he became a person who the Bible says that there has never been a prophet to arise like Moses in Israelites' history. Because he was able, in a sense, to see the future, to see the good that it could be, to see the bad that it could be, and that motivated him to do those things that were very, very difficult. And so what we need to understand from this is that the potential future can change our motivations turning what we hate into what we love. We hate exercising, but when we can truly see the long-term benefits of being healthy and fit for our families and for our children and for our grandchildren, and when we can hold that out in front of us, all of a sudden we can begin to love doing the things that we hate. We can begin to love watching what we eat. We can begin to love exercising more because we know where this is going to lead us when we truly have faith and believe it. And the opposite is true as well. The potential future of I'm just using health as an example because it's January 1st and everybody's thinking about health, but if we can see the future that's going to happen, despite if we don't change, how we won't have energy, how we won't be around for our grandchildren, how we won't be around for our own children, that can be a powerful motivator as well, but see, the key is believing it. And so as we talk about this and as we see in Scripture the ability to see the future being powerful, it's validated in all this research that's being done in behavioral change theory. There's a great book out called Change Anything, and a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about, a lot of the principles are modeled in Scripture and found in this book, and I've been studying this book, and it's a wonderful read. And in this book, it gives some tactics for how you can change your motivation. And a lot of them, these five tactics, they center around this idea of understanding the future. And I just wanted to share with you these five tactics because I think they were tactics that perhaps Moses might have used, but I know for sure we can use to develop our faith in what the future can be, both positive and negative, all right? So here's some ways that we do that. Here's some ways that we change that motivation, how we're able to see the future differently. And so that can change what we hate into what we love, all right? So the first thing we've been talking about this is visit your default future. Just visit it. Just close your eyes right now. Everybody close your eyes. Everybody hates when you do this. I know this is stupid and uncomfortable, but close your eyes. And some of you are going to rebel and not close your eyes, but close your eyes anyway, okay? And then fire from heaven if you don't close your eyes right on you, okay? All right, so think about the area in your life you want to change right now, okay? If you don't change, just visit yourself five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, 20 years from now. Where, are, where does your future end? Where is the default future for not changing those habits, those choices, if it's your finances, if it's your health, if it's your relationship with your spouse, if it's your relationship with your kids, whatever it might be, visit that default future and think about it. Where does it end? 
Is it a good place? Is it a bad place? Where does it end? What is the future that you can see? Now, think of it this way. If you begin making changes, where does it end? Where does the default future change and shift to if you begin to make choices that are different and begin to change habits and begin to change the things that you don't like to do? Can you be motivated to do them when you see the stark difference in those two futures? Okay, you can open your eyes now. Some of you fell asleep. Wake up. All right, so here we go. So that can be very powerful. Now, as you begin to do this, now I did this in my office this week as I was preparing the message. I actually wrote these things down. And so I would encourage you after today, do this with a piece of paper in front of you. Write down your default future. And then as you start thinking about your default future, I want you to tell the whole vivid story. This is another tactic. Be vivid in the telling of the story. All right? Don't use generic language like, well, I won't have any energy. Don't use generic language like, I'll be unhealthy if I don't quit smoking. Be vivid. If I, quit, if I don't quit smoking, I will end up with emphysema, lung cancer, problems with my breathing. I will not be able to walk down the street and breathe on my own. Be vivid with those things. If I don't change my habits relationally, don't say that my relationship will be stressful. Use the language that's vivid. I will end up in divorce, my family ripped apart. Pain in my children's life if I don't change this habit, if I don't get this under control. Use vivid language. Language is powerful. Language is very, 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 very powerful. And so leverage it. Try and get rid of the kind of generic words and bring into your vocabulary when you start talking about that default future, very vivid language. And then as you think about your life, as you think about where you want to be, as you think about this change area, as you think about how God is calling you to change, repent, turn away from something, begin to think about the values that you want to portray. Use value words in the description of who you are. Use value words when you think about what do you want to be? What do you want to become? What kind of character do you want to have? What are the character qualities that you want other people to say about you? And so use this idea of, of, this, of the language of values and use it everywhere. So you decide this is the type of character quality that I want, R write it around you, put little posters up, whatever it might be, that's more your environment, but begin to think about what are the values and there is a power in values. There's an incredible facility in San Francisco, California called the Delancey Street. And Delancey Street is a program where residents join to recover from drug and alcohol abuse. And so the Delancey Street project is very interesting in this, in this way. The Delancey Street is run completely by its founder, Mimi Silbert, and 1,500 residents, all with an average of 18 felony convictions. There's no staff at Delancey Street. There's no outside counselors, none. It's her and these 1,500 residents. Now what you need to know about Delancey Street is this, 90% success rate. 90% success rate at the Delancey Street. This place is studied by just about every popular book on change theory because it's such a bright spot in the world of recovery. And what they found is that they do amazing work, they do amazing things, and you have to remember in the, in the realm of recovery, 5% is oftentimes considered a good number. 5%, 90%. And when she talks to her residents and when they talk about changing motivations and learning to see the world differently, they're constantly using the language of values. Values, 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 because they're powerful. And this is what she says about using values. This is, this is pretty cool. She says, we talk about values all the time, even when we're teaching a new resident how to set the table while he's withdrawing from crack cocaine. We don't just talk about knives and forks. We talk about pride. We talk about pride, not just set the, not just set the fork here, set the knife here because it's the way you do it, but you do it to take pride in it. And then she goes on to say, we talk about showing respect for those who will sit at this place at the table. Now, you're not just setting this knife, but you're respecting them as a person to create a place for them. So you're not just setting the table, you're working as part of a team. Your portion are the knives and the fork and the silverware. Somebody else is doing this. It's that value of teamwork. She says, you're not letting people down. They're going to sit down, there's going to be a fork there. They're going to need that fork. You're not letting them down. Right? Again, that's that value of being trustworthy. You're becoming trustworthy. She says, it's values, values, values all the time. It's wildly important that we think about the values we want to have in our lives and get those in the forefront to change our motivations. 
Do I, want, do I want to value health? Do I want to be a person that people look at and can be encouraged and challenged? Because, because I understand that I'm valuing family when I value my health. See, those words become very, very powerful. Now, here's an interesting tactic that I think everybody can kind of get into. And I, thought, I, I debated whether or not to share with you this because it's kind of, it, it'll take a second. It's a little off topic, but this is an interesting one. So one of the ways you can change your motivations is turn your change area into a game into a game. Make it a game of some sort. Now, games are interesting because they all have three components. Most of the time, how many of you like to play games, by the way? Just enjoy a game, whether it's a sport, a video game, a just dance, horseshoes. Okay, yes, horseshoes. Yeah, that's a game, right? Most games have a time limit to them. There's a time component to it, even if it's just a social time component, like hurry up and throw the horseshoe. You're taking forever, right? There's usually, a, right, there's usually a, a, a time component to it. Then there's a challenge to it. There's some sort of a project that you have to do. You're trying to do something that's reasonable. And then there's also a scoring system, right? A game has to be scored. So in this area of your life, you want to learn to change your motivation. You turn it into a game, your motivation is going to change. You're going to begin to do the things that you don't like to do. And here's a wonderful example of it. One of the change people that they had studied in this book, Changing Anything, had gone through a doctorate program, had done everything except the dissertation. And if you're familiar with doctoral work, this is the culmination of it. It's a 180 to 200 page document. You spend a tremendous amount of time researching and then you write. Well, years and years and years had gone by and this person had just put it off because they dreaded it. They dreaded it. They hated the idea of sitting down and writing this incredible document. So here's what he did. He turned it into a game. So he said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give myself 90 days, right? There's the time frame. He said, I'm going to give myself 90 days to write this 180 page document. And then he said, the, the, the challenge that I'm going to give myself is, I'm going to challenge myself to do two pages per day. And he said, he thought that was reasonable. He felt like he could write two pages per day with his eyes closed. That was not a huge challenge, so it's something that he could be successful at. And then what he did for the score, this is fascinating, I thought. He borrowed doctoral robes. So when you get your doctorate, you get this cool robe that you wear that has stripes on the arms and a neat little hat, okay? What he did was he took that had somebody take a picture of him in borrowed doctoral robes. He cut that picture into 90 little pieces, and every day that he wrote his two pages, he posted a piece of the picture and started making the picture. And what he found was that became, during those 90 days, the most rewarding part of his day was taking that little piece of that picture and putting it in the bigger picture. And what he once hated to do, sit down and write, the idea of trying to get this done, he began to love because he turned it into a simple game. Now, how could you take that logic and apply it into your life, change your motivations? Did he see his future? Absolutely. He knew that by getting his doctorate, he was going to get a 10% raise. As soon as he got that piece of paper, 10% raise, he knew what his future was, but he just couldn't change the motivation. But he was able to do it when he turned it into a game. So that's one way that we can change our motivation. And here's kind of the, this is what it all comes down to, I think. You have to create a personal motivation statement. You need to use the idea of your default future. Use the idea of vivid language, the values. Maybe even talk about in that statement how you're going to do it. But more importantly, using the vivid language and the values. Create a statement that you will use to motivate you into the future you want into the future you believe that God has for you, regardless of your present, regardless of the past mistakes. What is the future that you believe that you have the faith that God will help you achieve, that you feel God is calling you to in these areas of your life, whatever that area might be, whether it's healthy habits, whether it's finances, whether it's small, whatever, you know, the, the things that we're trying to change. There's a wonderful story in the book about a woman named Rosemary. And Rosemary... Uh, escaped a life of prostitution, of being a drug addict, and of being a drug dealer. One day caught in this intense world, she decided, this isn't who I want to be. I need to change. And we're talking about some significant changes, changes that most of us will never have to try and change. And so what she does is she makes this very daring move, and there was a woman that she admired greatly, and so she got a job working for her as a clerical assistant. And she just began to make the choices, make the changes, and, and she would have her ups and downs. But one day, her boss came to her, this woman who she deeply respected and admired, and said to her, Rosemary, I want to thank you so much for being such a dependable person. And that just kind of shook her world. And Rosemary thought to herself, you know what? I've been called a lot of things, but I've never been called dependable, and that's who I want to be. And so she set out to write a statement that she would use 
that talked about her default future, that used vivid language, that used values, so that she could look to that statement when she was tempted to go back. When she was tempted to turn away back to the things that she loved doing, she would stick to the things that she hated doing, that she was growing to love. And so she wrote this very, very simple statement, and I think it's a great example for all of us in the area that we're trying to change, to adopt. This was her very simple statement that she kept with her and read thousands and thousands of times. She said, I am not a hooker. I am not a dealer. I am not an addict. I'm the kind of person others can depend on. You know, that may seem kind of foolish, that may seem simple, and that may seem kind of uh, jovial, but you know what? It's powerful when we think about that's what faith is. You infuse God into this idea that, you know what? God has created me not as an addict or a hooker or a dealer. God has created me as someone other people can depend on. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I can make these changes because that's who I am. That's what I'm trying to be. And that can motivate us to get on the treadmill. That can motivate us to not buy the pack of cigarettes. That can motivate us to start spending less and saving more. That can motivate us to making sure that we're using healthy words with our spouse when we get frustrated and anger. That can motivate us to spend more time on the carpet with our kids playing when we don't want to. But we have to keep this in the forefront of our minds. In John chapter eight, verse 32, Jesus says, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. What is the truth about your future? If you don't change the area that you feel like God is calling you to change, where will you end? What is the truth of where you can be if you do change, if you do rely on God's strength? Where will you end up? We need that truth to set us free from the bondage of our bad choices, our bad relationships, our bad health, our bad finances, our, our, all that stuff, all that, all that sin that gets in the way of all that God has for us. I believe wholeheartedly that the truth of where we can be can be so motivating. It can change us and we can learn to do the things that we hate doing because we love the, truly love and believe the future can exist, that someday can happen today. So what about Moses? How did it end for Moses, right? Well, Moses, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, it, it goes on and it says, it was by faith that Moses left the land of Egypt. He wasn't fearing the king's anger, but he kept right on going because because he kept his eyes on the one who was invisible. Moses led the people. Moses led them right up to the point where somebody else came and took over and led them into the promised land. He never himself actually entered the promised land, but he could see it. And he knew that that was better than the pleasures of sin. And he was able to press on and able to keep going and keep moving forward, not because he only knew the, the good things in the preferred future, but because he kept his eyes on the future God wanted for him on this invisible one. And so the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 12 begins to sum this all up. And he begins to talk about us and what it means for our lives and how we develop that good reputation. And the writer says this, let us run the race with endurance. Let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. And we do this just like Moses by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. See, it's Jesus who can put inside of us the vision for our lives that is wonderful, that is appropriate, that is healthy, that, that can be a legacy. It's him who puts that ability for us to see into our future. And if we'll cling to him, we'll recognize that he'll give us the strength to do that. And, it, and, and then the writer of Hebrews, this is great, he validates Jesus, why we can trust Jesus, why we can trust that he can help us see our future. It says, because you can do this because of the joy awaiting him. Jesus had this vision of the future, this vision of the joy that would be his, and so he endured the cross. There's no person who can read the scripture and say Jesus loved the cross. He hated it, didn't want it, but he chose it. He was able to see this joy that would happen, this preferred future, this destiny for all of us. And so he learned to love what he hated so that we might reap the benefits of it. And so he endured, we can endure, and we can disregard the shame, and we can disregard the, the negative side and that stuff we don't like and the pain because we know what happens. And I love how it says now. What a great word, now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. See, Jesus knew that someday on the other side of the cross, 
He would bring hope to the world and forgiveness to everyone, and he would be seated in honor for you and I to make now possible, for us to turn our some days into nows. We have to learn to see and truly believe and have the faith that the future God wants for us can happen. And when we do that, we'll have one more tool in the toolbox for making long-term change and realizing all that great stuff that we know can be true someday today. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace and your mercy and your love. Thank you for your conviction that's causing all of us to search our hearts and know where we need to change. And so God, I pray that you'd help us to learn to shift our motivations by seeing the future as you would have us see it. Give us the faith, God, to believe not only the preferred future that you have for us, but the default future if we don't change. And may that knowledge and may that true belief put inside of our hearts this desire to change. And may we begin to learn to love the things that are so difficult for us that we hate doing. May our motivation shift and may we learn to love and embrace us because they know where they will lead us. Give us the faith that's required, God. In Jesus' name, amen.